Now, I would like to invite Lieutenant General Retired Khalid Ahmed Kedwai, the advisor to the National Command Authority and the former Director General of the Strategic Plan Division Pakistan to deliver his keynote address. Lieutenant General Khalid Ahmed Kedwai served in the Pakistan Army for 47 years in various command, staff and instructional appointments. After the May 1998 nuclear test, he pioneered the establishment of Pakistan's National Command Authority and was appointed appointed as the founding director general of the strategic plan division in April 1999. He served as DGSPD for 15 years. Lieutenant General Kidwai has been awarded the Pakistan's highest civil award and the Nishani Imtiaz in addition to Hilale Imtiaz. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure indeed, as always, to be amongst friends and top international and national academics, intellectuals at the 8th CIWS IISS workshop. For someone who has been associated with this excellent initiative from the very beginning for almost a decade now, I find it most satisfying to see that the joint professional forum of the two leading think tanks of Pakistan and the United Kingdom continues to strengthen year after year. The forum has matured and it has maintained a strong forward momentum while focusing and remaining engaged with the dynamics of a delicately balanced state of strategic stability in South Asia. It has kept with the times as it grapples with rapidly changing geopolitical scenarios emerging out of evolving strategic global play and technology developments. Amongst others, the one thing that I find reassuring and comforting about the forum is consistency and continuity, in that the highly regarded members of the forum of intellectuals and academics from both sides have seen the decade through providing quality inputs because of what one may term as institutional approach with institutional memory. I think the DNA of the forum has developed well. At international forums like this, the IISSCIISS forum, I strongly believe that freedom of thought and expression of a variety of views, sometimes opposing, play a pivotal role in contributing meaningfully towards arriving at a rich mix of objective strategic thought and I pray that the forum will continue to have a bright future and go from strength to strength in carrying on the good work. I warmly welcome the International Institute of Strategic Studies delegation from the UK. At the outset, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to recall a fundamental strategic reality prevailing in South Asia with reference to the swinging pendulum of the strategic stability instability paradigm. In February 2020, when we last met in London, I had pointed out <clears throat> the specific examples from five decades since the 1971 war between India and Pakistan, that over time it had become by default Pakistan's responsibility to ensure that the delicately poised balance of the state of strategic stability in South Asia will not be allowed to drift into a state of strategic instability or imbalance thereby threatening regional peace. I had enumerated in some detail a consistent pattern in the India's attempts to create strategic imbalances in futile attempts to disadvantage Pakistan and its security under the very convenient cover of a China threat. I had also mentioned seven destabilizing events which had nothing to do with the so-called China threat when India chose to induce strategic instability in the region on an average of once every decade. These included 
a variety of provocative conduct like repeated induction of destabilizing weapons and systems, conventional and nuclear, adoption of offensive and destabilizing doctrines, conventional and nuclear, conducting threatening military exercises with live ammunition and logistics close to our international borders, which brought India and Pakistan to the brink of war on at least two occasions, requiring the sanity of international interventions to impose calm, conduct of nuclear tests, ballistic cruise missile tests, conducting recklessly ill-conceived and poorly executed military operations, obviously labeled as surgical strikes on land and air, and now for some years willingly becoming the cat's paw through joining destabilizing alliances and groupings conceived, fueled, and encouraged by international powers in their attempts to contain China. In the same context, I had also stated then in February 2020, and would like to reiterate once again that all through these five decades long Indian attempts at generating strategic instability to Pakistan's disadvantage, Pakistan did not remain oblivious to the resultant induced and enhanced threat spectrum of any manner. Pakistan has in the past and will continue in the future to respond through its own calm and calculated strategies, evolving pragmatic and cost-effective response options to correct the imbalance and re-establish the disturbed strategic stability very quickly whenever that happens. As an example of not too long ago, I can refresh memories by recalling Pakistan's strong repost of 27th February 2019, when the Pakistan Air Force, under the policy of quid pro quo plus, took the Indian Air Force to task in less than 24 hours for its sub-professional transgression against Pakistani sovereignty at Balakot. The quid pro quo plus retribution included two fighter planes downed over Kashmir, one of the pilots captured and repatriated, senior military leadership present in a brigade headquarters spared during the Rajori counter strike, an intruding submarine detected in Pakistani waters ordered to return home unharmed by Pakistan Navy, and a helicopter crash with seven casualties in an internal fratricide. The retribution ought to have conveyed Pakistan's policy, intent, and determination to ensure that strategic stability will be maintained at all cost. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, has always been and will continue to be that Pakistan will never, and I repeat, that Pakistan will never compromise on its national security and vital national interests. You can therefore be certain that Pakistan will fulfill its responsibility to ensure that strategic stability in South Asia will continue to prevail in the interest of peace. I'm sure the message will be noted. It has been a little over two and a half years since this forum last met in London in February 2020. The broad agenda drawn up for today's workshop most aptly reflects and encapsulates some of the major issues and developments during this period. Within the parameters of the agenda, by the end of the day, the forum would have reflected and discussed in two sessions important drivers of strategic stability and instability in South Asia, both political and technological. Before these, in the inaugural session, one can expect a stimulating discussion on the painstakingly prepared IISS monograph titled Nuclear Deterrence and Strategic Stability in South Asia, Perceptions and Reality. While reserving my right to differ on certain views and op opinions expressed in the monograph, I would like to extend my sincere compliments to the eminent authors, Mr. Antoine Levesque, Mr. Desmond Bowen, and Mr. John Gill, on the high quality of the intellectual work and the academic effort that has gone into preparing that study. The two eminent speakers of the inaugural session will have much more to say on this. If you look back on the two and a half years that have gone by, you will agree that the COVID-19 pandemic, though a massive global health disaster, did not prevent the world from moving on on the international geopolitical mosaic. The global challenges of superpower rivalry and jostling for competition have only sharpened global and regional fault lines, leaving a large number of affected countries to generally fend for themselves in an effort to prevent ending up on the wrong side of history and events. 
Largely, the major development during the period has taken place in Europe with the outbreak of war in Ukraine. We have seen that just as the US was preparing to focus more sharply on China and the Asia Pacific region by winding up in Afghanistan and reducing its footprint in the Middle East, the war in Ukraine suddenly became the central political military issue that has taken away the focus, at least for some time now, from the US China competition and rivalry and refocused on the US Russia rivalry. In many ways, a US versus Russia come China rivalry as the recent Shanghai Cooperation Organization SCO meeting demonstrated. The Ukraine war has had fallout effects, most certainly in South Asia, strategic, political, and economic. The full impact of these is yet to be fully determined. Additionally, superpower rivalries and competition also cast a shadow in our region because groupings like AUKUS and Quad encourage arms buildup and destabilize South Asian strategic stability. In this context, it is important to state that true to tradition, India has chosen to play a double game with the West by playing on both sides of the fence. India draws all the benefits of the Western compulsion to prop it up as its cat's paw against China without undertaking any meaningful obligations or commitments. When it is payback time, India's policy of neutrality in the Ukraine war and disconnect with the West on sanctions against Russia are real life examples of hardcore real politic at play with the West watching quite helplessly. We are not impressed by Prime Minister Modi's recent lecture to President Putin's face on the Ukraine war. Russia understands India's need for a diplomatic double play. As for AUKUS, the India and its lobbyists are already sending out feelers wherein they see an opportunity to replicate to India's advantage at some point in time in the future, the nuclear proliferation exemption that is going Australia's way with a supply of eight US built nuclear submarines by 2040. If the instability pendulum were to swing that way in South Asia once again, because of yet another play in exceptionalism, it is not difficult to foresee the strategic effects that will be generated on strategic stability and on Pakistan's security. I have no hesitation in stating that minimum Pakistani countermeasures would be put in place if a reckless imbalance is induced in South Asia. It is not a warning. It's a contingency foreseen. There are examples from the past when international exceptionalism has repeatedly been employed in South Asia without a consideration given to Pakistani security concerns. But then there are also examples when Pakistan did not let international exceptionalism stand in its way to address the imbalances. I would like to say that much has been made of India's exaggerated notions of a so-called threat from China as a convenient cover for masking India's buildup against Pakistan and ambitions as a regional power. India is being wishfully propped up by the West as a potential counterweight to China, giving short shrift to strategic stability in South Asia. History is quite clear that the China card has been played, perhaps overplayed, repeatedly by India to the Western gallery for acquisition of modern Western weaponry, high technology, and proliferation exemptions. History also tells us the unfortunate outcomes of India's strategies, military ambitions, and the weaponries in 1962, and lately in Doklam and Ladakh. Even the latest so-called disengagement agreement in Ladakh is essentially formalization and freezing of the reverses that India suffered in 2020. I'll leave it at that. I want to move on another issue that I had raised in London in 2020 with regard to the seriousness of a new factor as an emerging threat to strategic stability, not only in South Asia, but one that would pose in due course of time an extended threat to the region and to the world at large. In the two and a half years gone by, the threat has only hardened and assumed a real life character and momentum of its own. I refer to the toxic and lethal mix of the rise of hardcore and ruthlessly aggressive Hindutva fundamentalist ideology, which has permeated all sections of Indian society, the Indian government, and has found welcome resonance among the Indian diaspora in the West. Together with the custodial controls of India's large triad of the nuclear arsenal now having fallen firmly in the hands 
of an extremist fundamentalist leadership. This toxic mix of poisonous ideology and custody of nuclear weapons is a relatively new phenomenon and poses serious threat to strategic stability in South Asia, putting it on edge. The intoxication of the extremists was put on full display at the highest levels of India's BJP leadership when it opted to attack Pakistan's mainland territory, not disputed territory, but mainland territory, in February 2019 at Balakot, oblivious to the serious consequences of committing aggression against a nuclear weapons power. That Pakistan responded with a measured but strong repost that I have mentioned earlier was a sign of Pakistan's maturity and restraint. Now fast forward to March 22 this year. To yet another Indian military aggression inside three years against Pakistan's mainland territory. The now BJP oriented Indian military launched deep inside Pakistan, a nuclear capable Brahmos missile with a control trajectory, pre-planned vertical and horizontal waypoint coordinates fed into the onboard guidance and control computer, along with the geographical coordinates of the launch point and the target. The objective was very clear, to test Pakistan's air defense alert levels and operational responses. India did not particularly care that the missile posed a destructive threat for some seven to eight minutes to at least a dozen commercial airlines in the air at the time. I would like to state with complete responsibility and confidence that the launch was no accident, as claimed slyly by India. The launch could not have taken place without political clearance at the highest level and detailed planning over a number of days and weeks in the military chain of command to include technical preparations of the missile, the missile launcher, storage and ground deployment drills with full involvement of the immediate missile launch crew of at least 10 to 15 odd personnel, besides the hundreds of other personnel that comprise Abrahamos strategic missile group. Ladies and gentlemen, I have lived breathed and conducted test and training launches with troops on ground of an array of strategic ballistic and cruise missiles for 15 years as DGSPD, perhaps over 15 number. I know my missiles and missile technology. I know the sequence of technical preparations, the sequence of deployment drills and SOPs that just have to be followed without which a missile launch can never take place. Nuclear capable ballistic and cruise missiles are highly complex state-of-the-art machines with meticulously detailed and controlled long pro launch procedures and SOPs, including the capability to self-destruct if things go wrong. These do not fire off accidentally like infantry rifles during weapons cleaning drills. India put out a well-rehearsed though laughable cover story of an accidental launch, which is technically and operationally speaking entirely mischievous to pull wool over our eyes and the world's. No serious professional will buy the silly story. Three IEF officers have reportedly been made the fall guys for what essentially was a military operation conducted against Pakistan. I recommend strongly that India look after them and compensate them well for their silence. On both occasions at Balakot 2019 and Shorkot 2022, Pakistan displayed restraint and maturity in diffusing the irresponsibly generated tensions, thereby preventing South Asia from spiraling into potential catastrophes. It will, be, it will be foolhardy to take Pakistan's restraint and maturity as a weakness and continue to test the limits of strategic stability. Perhaps India is attempting to establish a pattern of incidents over time as a strategy in order to desensitize the international community for further future operations. No address on strategic stability by a Pakistani speaker can be complete without drawing attention to the criticality of conflict resolution for peace and stability in South Asia. Peace and stability in our region will unfortunately remain ever elusive till a just and honorable resolution of the Kashmir dispute is found to the satisfaction of all parties to the dispute, India, Pakistan, and the Kashmiris. India and the world can continue to delay the resolution of the Kashmir, Kashmir conflict for another day through brutality, suppression, political engineering, apartheid of the worst kind, and what have you. But Kashmir can never be brushed under the carpet forever. Kashmir will remain a bleeding wound. Human spirit has resilience, the ferocity of which has come back to haunt the oppressor at various points in history. 
India might consider taking a lesson or two from a variety of freedom movements around the world for centuries past. Being at the core of South Asian peace and stability, the Kashmir dispute will have to be addressed with maturity, dignity, and statesmanship. On its part, Pakistan will continue to extend moral and political support to the Kashmiri freedom movement till that happens. There are benefits in strategic patience. I have highlighted issues that affect strategic stability in South Asia, subjecting the stability instability paradigm to swing either way, sometimes dangerously and to the brink. These are Pakistani perspectives. I quite understand that there are Indian and international perspectives on the issues as well as geopolitical pulls and pressures which cast their shadows in our region. Many of the earlier workshop, workshops conducted at this forum, which carried an important voice worldwide, have discussed and debated the issues of South Asian strategic stability from a variety of angles. Today again is an opportunity to examine these not only from angles as planned in the agenda, but also in the discussion sessions to go beyond the agenda if necessary, in search of ways and means that might be helpful in furthering the goal of bringing the elusive strategic stability to a region where two nuclear parts continue to remain locked eyeball to eyeball. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, I, um, I was struck by your um, very firm statement about the launch of the Ramos missile across the international border as being no accident, uh, but being a deliberate act, a planned act, and indeed a uh, politically approved act. Um, and um, I won't quiz you as to what intelligence you have to that effect, um, because you won't tell me, um, and quite rightly. Um, but um, accidents do happen. Um, and indeed, in the wider world, um, I certainly have not been aware of that sort of firm affirmation as being something that has wide support. And in terms of um, just thinking about accidents, um, I mean, I would recall that some really appalling um, nuclear behavior took place in the United States, I guess, 10 years and more ago, when nuclear weapons were moved from one airbase to another. Um, and it was thought in the process that these were actually practice runs or you know, not proper bombs, but it turns out they were proper bombs. The, the upshot of that was, and I think they were on two counts, um, and, and William, you know, I think knows this much better than, than I do, but um, I mean, the upshot of that, I think, was that not only did the chief of the air staff, but also the secretary of air in the Pentagon were summarily removed, and in fact, not summarily, there was an investigation and there were consequences. But there was, you know, so my only point really is that accidents do happen, you know, and even in the kind of largest and most extensive uh, organizations. And I, I mean, your, your affirmation was very, very firm. And I, I just sort of wonder whether, you know, you, the, the grounds for saying that it was deliberate and that it had political approval, you know, is something that you have absolute confidence about or whether there are some areas of, of, as it were, a question mark. Well, if you want me to reiterate what I stated, <laughs> I will not, certainly want to reiterate the reasoning and the rationale that I gave. I would agree with your uh, strictly point, strict point in uh, principle, and that is accidents do happen. Yes, you're right, accidents do happen. It can happen right here with this bottle of water also. The point is, that there are different technologies in which accidents happen. Like I said, rifles fire off. You're cleaning a, having a weapon cleaning drill, that happens, happen. people get killed. People get killed at the quarter guard in the unit quarter guard because accidents happen. And there was a bullet in the rifle which nobody bothered to check. So accidents do happen in principle, I agree with that. Anywhere it can happen, it can happen on the road and it can happen in the military, it can happen with equipment. The point that I have made my assessment about a specific high-tech 
supersonic Brahma screws design is that I gave you all the arguments and this is my assessment based on my experience. I said uh, we fired any number of uh, you know missiles in Pakistan. There is just no way that a cruise missile or a ballistic missile can just fire off with an like an accident. They have to be uh, preparations, like I said, all kinds of preparations. They have to be pre storage pre preparation in the storage. They have to be preparations on the ground. They have to be preparations through the SOPs of deployment drills. And then there's a countdown that continues. It's a teamwork that, that happens. You have to feed coordinates into the missile, cruise missile uh, particularly. Launch point coordinates, the target point coordinates, the target, the coordinates on the waypoints. Where will the missile vary its high altitude from 500 feet to 1,000 feet to 40,000 feet? Where will it turn left? Where will it turn right? These are all coordinates that are pre-fed. This is a uh, onboard computer exercise which is based, and it has to be fed like this computer is sitting there. They have to sit down properly and feed the, the coordinates. So, and then to call it that this has happened by accident, it, it is totally, I said, it's a, it's a very silly thing for a professional like me and a professional like uh, Sephiroth, who have whose bread and butter has been to conduct missile test, ballistics, uh, missile test, missile test. So I'm not at all, uh, I'm not at all willing to accept this as, a, as an accident. And secondly, to go back to the missile incident, um, to what extent was there any communication at all with India, two-way, um, something of a discussion, no discussion at all. Can you elaborate just to clarify Pakistan's uh, view over this? Thank you. And uh, sorry, what was your second question? The second question related to the extent to which there may have been any communication at all, two-way, with India in the first 48 hours of the missile incident taking place. Your clarification as to any as to whether anything um, there was any degree of communication with with India. If there wasn't, um, please please do say so. I think Pakistan acted very maturely in this particular incident. And it did not want to aggravate, recognizing fully well that uh, this was uh, no accident. And recognizing the efficacy and efficiency of our systems where we track the whole thing. The trajectory was tracked from beginning to the end. The trajectory was tracked as it turned into Pakistan, initially going one way within India and then taking a turn, which I said you have to have waypoint coordinates fed into the system. Without waypoint, waypoint, waypoint coordinates and the thing, the missile will just keep going. So that trajectory was also uh, tracked by the Pakistani system, air defense system, Pakistan Air Force, all the way within those seven, eight minutes that it was in the air. But having done that, it was, I think it was, it was, a, it was a political decision at the highest level not to overplay it. Having recognized that the, what the intent was, it was a political decision not to overplay it. But if Pakistan wanted to respond in a military manner, in a political manner, it could have done in, in, in many other different ways. So the end state perhaps that we wanted was not to aggravate the situation. 